Today our guest was Dapo Adiola. I personally knew Dapo when he worked at the gym right next to the Facebook London office. I bought a print from him back in 2015 and I'm inspired to see how far he has come. He exudes passion and his voice is filled with energy. He speaks from the heart and isn't afraid to share his opinions about what isn't right about the creative industries. Dapo comes from a humble background and I love his story of one of his mentors encouraging him in art school. That spark of encouragement helped give Dapo the strength to spend nearly a decade striving to become a successful artist. If you see Dapo's story on the news, you might think of this as an overnight success. But our conversation reminded me that overnight success often requires persistence over many, many years. I personally can't wait for one of Dapo's characters to be the next Mickey Mouse. And the way things are going, I'm sure that's not going to be too far from now. Dapo spent over 15 years working various 9 to 5 jobs whilst honing his craft under the moonlight uh, before he hit the big time in illustration with Look Up. He started from humble beginnings of a passion for illustration and he's now broken into the industry and is regarded as some of the finest talent in the world. He also works hard to open doors for others, particularly those from underrepresented backgrounds. There's some things we can't tell you about what he's working on right now, but you are going to hear glimpses of those throughout this episode. Dapo is definitely someone to watch. Illustration is all about bringing stories to life, and Dapo's story becomes increasingly colourful every single day. I hope you guys enjoy this. So Anthony was right about the very first one, which was... Okay. Um, I studied um, graphic design at a degree level, graphic design and advertising. And the reason I studied that course was because I had no idea that illustration was a thing that I could do, that someone that looked like me could do. And that's a very, very important thing because, um, you know, in school, I read up on illustrators, Quentin Blake, Ron Sell, favorites, my favorites, Dr. Zeus, you know, and they were all old, elderly, middle-aged looking white men. And there was never a black illustrator. I never saw that. I never, ever saw that as a kid, ever. I didn't start seeing that until I was in my mid-20s and I was looking abroad. That's where I saw it. I didn't see it on these shores. I saw it in America. In America, there were black illustrators. There have been black illustrators. They have a rich history of black artists. You won't right. find that anywhere else in the West, right? Like, you, we've got it over here. There are black British fine artists, but it's not as yeah. rich a history as you can find amongst African-Americans, right? So I was always looking over in that direction couldn't find anything over here. And because I was looking and it was so detached and so distant, I couldn't imagine myself as a black British boy doing that. I just always thought, you know, oh, it's only gonna be in America. It's only gonna be in America. So I just kind of fantasized about it from a very, very safe and comfortable distance, right? So I thought, well, if I can't be an illustrator because, you know, only Americans, um, I can definitely be a graphic designer, right? So, you know, and also graphic design at the time, I'm a Nigerian as well. So graphic design at the time was the only reputable thing I could say that was art related that I could tell my guardian at the time or any members of my family that I do without them thinking, oh my God, what the hell? You know, it sounds nice, graphic design. Oh, I'm a graphic designer. You're not going to be like, oh, you're going to be a bum. Like, you're not going to think that. If I said I was a fine artist or I painted, they'd be like, what? You paint walls? What's, what's going on? They, it's just, you know, art is not the thing that we champion right so because of that i chose graphic design and advertising i went through the three years of my course tailoring every brief that i got to allow me to illustrate craig burston is the guy's name who we're talking about here he was my Professor? lecturer for the first year yeah he was my lecturer for the first year and um first year is, is where he kind of he's he's the lecturer that has to look after all the all the fresh kids in the first year you know and he's very fun as a result of that he understands we're youthful we're exuberant and we want to get stuck into we want to be creative you know, we want to be creative. So he's very fun. He's, he's a great teacher like that. Really great guy. And um, he had me for the first year. You know, he really, I think first year was where I really excelled. Second year was a challenge. Third year was just like, okay, I've got my groove. I know what my thing is. I am the group, the, the year group. I'm the illustrator of the year group. Everybody knew me as that, even though I didn't embrace the title, because again, I just couldn't really see, I couldn't join the dots. So I spent three years drawing for all my briefs. I managed to get decent grades, got to, to, to the third year, um, doing a dissertation, and I'm doing a dissertation on children's books about how you can teach children different things using picture books, right? And one of the things I wanted to do was a counting book with the tortoise and the hare, and I might still revisit this someday, but it was a counting book where there are 10 tortoises and they cheat, basically. 
and you know, I was going to do that book. I did designed all the characters, did my dissertation, got to my third um, and final critique, right? There's like two months left till we finish the course, right? And I'm in the critique um, and we're about to finish and, and the, the lecturer critiquing me was like, you know, this is all really nice stuff, but you know, I'm afraid you're not going to pass the course. I said, what, why? And she was like, oh, well, you know, this isn't a graphic design um, dissertation. This is a illustration dissertation. And, again not knowing the difference the significant difference between the two and just thinking to myself well why would you wait until my third year to say stuff like this to me she then said to me well have you ever considered maybe doing an illustration degree and the first thing i thought was are you taking the piss i mean your job as my lecturer is to advise me on these things you i've been drawing for three years nobody has ever suggested that right so these times i'm um how old was i, I was about 23 and i was really deflated like, and a thing about me is leading up to this point, most children that I know of on the course have a parent or a guardian or somebody who looks after them, who takes an active interest in the role and trajectory that their life goes in. Your parents will sit down and have conversations with you about what you want to be, where you want to go. Mm -hmm. After secondary school, that shit stopped for me. There was nobody, right? So I had to decide and pick the direction that I was going in. And my lecturers at A-level will tell you straight up and down, I was directionless. All I knew is I wanted to draw, right? So I got onto that particular course that we're talking about by fluke, a series of very fortunate events, which is my life, right? I failed A-level art and design and I failed A-level graphic design. And the reason I failed wasn't because I wasn't good. It was because I wasn't focused, right? If you read my report, it says that. Darren, a guy called Darren, I can't remember his last name. He was my lecturer and he he's another person. And I'm going to give you four moments, right? So he's another okay. person that actually ended up changing things for me so going back to a level i'm going to come back to finish the other story but going back to a level what had happened was i failed both courses um art and design and graphic design but darren had taken my portfolio and unbeknownst to me we had lecturers from Croydon college visiting us at the time and they were here scouting for people to do what's known as a foundation access course which is what gives you access to the degree course that i went on to do so darren took my portfolio into this room and he just sent me a text message he's like Dapo, you need to show up at this room at this time so I just showed up not knowing what to expect and my work's on the table and these two guys are sitting across from me and they're like, oh, this is really good work. I'm like, yeah, I know it is. It's my work. You know? <laughs> and they were like, how would you, would you like a place on our foundation degree course? And I was like, yeah, fuck it. Like, I mean, I'm not going anywhere after this. I've just failed both of these courses. So, you know, got into the foundation course, aced it, had a great time on there and then ended up on this degree course to be sitting in this room three years later talking to this lecturer who's telling me I'm going to fail. So as the person who doesn't have anybody to, you, I can't go home to my parents and expect them to fight my corner. I can't do that because there's nobody at home that, that would take that kind of interest. So I was deflated completely, left the course and just didn't bother showing up for the remainder of the two months. About a month and a half in, I get a call from Craig. He's like, Dapo, you haven't attended for, for over a month. What's going on? Like, um, do you wanna, and I told him, you know, I'm not coming back. And he was like, okay, well, before you make that decision, can I, you know, can we sit down and have a talk? And I, I came in and I told him what had happened. And, you know, he was really crushed. He was just like, that's really shit. Like, and, you know, he's like, I really apologize on behalf of the faculty. And I said, that's not your job. It's not your place to apologize. And he was like, look, dude, you're very, very talented just don't stop drawing wherever you do and it sounds corny and it is but that stuck like that really really stuck and I remember there would be times after that where it just came back and it it, it, it kind of sat on my shoulders because again I was like 23 at the time so fast forward a couple of years now to my second transition period yeah. my transition Sorry, period quick, quick question on the first one though so when he yeah. said you're really talented don't stop mm. was that the first time that you'd felt so much support when it came to like confidence in your art skills is it the fact that you said it when you were at a very big low time. no that's literally the first time that's literally the first time anybody who had that position of power has ever said that to me mm -hmm. like literally the first time friends will say to you you know your friends they love you oh you, yeah, that is amazing he's a brilliant artist he's fantastic that's your friend that's yeah. part of their job, right? Because yeah. they'd be pretty shit friends if they were like, oh, you're terrible, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's part of their job. But to hear it from a person who, who, who as a child or as a student, you give that power and that authority over you, to hear it from that person was validated in a way that I didn't even know I needed, right? It made a massive difference because he doesn't have to say that. He could just be yeah. like, oh, you know what? Really sorry. 
really sorry that's happened to you, mate. Um, best of luck, yeah. you know. But he wasn't like that. You know, he was like, you're really talented. I love your work. And he did, because all, all through the years, even when Craig wasn't our lecturer, he would come into the classroom to see what I'm working on. Because I shared that passion for animation yeah. that he had. And I love that nerdy stuff that he loved as well. So he was always like, you know, what are you working on? Like he'd be hovering over me in, 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 in the computer room, looking at what I'm coloring in and stuff. And, you know, he, he knew that about me. So he said that. And I felt it came from a very genuine knowledge of me throughout those years. So it stuck. Um, and does, then my does, second and, of, and sorry, sorry, just to, to, on that again, does he know the level of impact that had? I'm sure you're still friends with him, right? Or like, did, I've told the story a million okay. times. He knows. <laughs> he, beams, he beams with pride all the time. Yeah. Craig will like <laughs> sneak, he will sneak under my interviews and he'll be like, I talk yeah. him. That's me. Like, I'm, I'm that like, Craig. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, that's me. Like, so he knows. He knows. He's, he's a fantastic guy. He's on, he's on my Twitter page and he's like, I, know, I taught him. I'm like, yeah, yeah. That's, I, I don't mind him having that because, again, like I said, I needed somebody to, to see that in me when I couldn't see it myself and he did so you know I'll always always tell that story so um the second stage happened now so after I finished and I you know I, I left the course and I finished my stint in education I was working part-time um in retail and then I ended up working um I, I ended up working at a gym <laughs> at Virgin Active um in my first sort of my first year or so at Virgin Active I did a sales job and why did Again, you, these are, why did you pursue that? Was that just random? Did you think like, no, it was an interesting working out. I love working out. I absolutely love working out. I've been working out since I was 16. So I figured, you know, what job can I do where I can get a free gym membership and also get good money? And that was it. It was a salesperson. And also it was Virgin. It was a company that had a certain, you know, vibe, you know, certain level. You can hold, your head, you can hold yeah. your head up. You can hold your head up a little bit and say, yeah, I work for Virgin Active. And, you know, you wouldn't get laughed out of a room. So, um, you know, I got that job, crazy way I got that job. Um, I've never done sales before. They needed an experienced salesperson at the time. I came in for an interview off a recommendation from a friend of mine who was a sales manager at another branch. And um, he recommended me to a branch manager friend of his. And I came in and like, this is, this is I'm 24, 24 at this time. And I don't have the language to describe the kind of person I am right and it's almost like you know something about yourself but again you don't have the language to describe it so I know that I can walk into any room observe learn something and then start talking with knowledge about that thing right I've always had that quality I know now that my dad has that quality the only difference is I'm informed about the stuff I choose to open my mouth about but um he's not like he, just, he will just talk and blag you and you'll be like did I just did I mind no, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> that sounds like a fun like, Christmas dinner, though. <laughs> Mate, depends on who you're asking. Um, <laughs> um, so, like, I knew, I knew, I knew something about myself, but that that gift, that gift comes from a place of curiosity because I'm genuine. I'm not trying to blag you. I want to know about this thing. Like, I really want to know about it. So, I sat with the um, the cell, the the gym manager at the time. David, his name was, and um we just had a conversation. It wasn't even an interview. I came prepared for an interview. We were just talking. We were talking about training patterns, um, you know, our workout regime, stuff that I'm interested in. And nowhere did we talk about sales. And I left and I walked to the bus stop thinking, that was a nice chat. Two hours, right? Fucking two mm -hmm. hour interview. I just left thinking that was a nice chat. And I got a text message saying, yeah, um, would you like the job? I was like, what didn't even ask me any questions about like sales history i mean I, the, the most interesting thing we talked about re regarding um working was that i had been working since i was 14 years old right and i told him a story about how i got my first job and all of these things so he made a call based on my personality as a person based on my ability to keep him talking and keep him engaged he made a call i had no sales experience right so i started this job um, as a salesperson and i excelled like i smashed all my targets on a monthly basis the person who then got the job of my sales manager who started on the same month as me is now a really good friend of mine Laman. and the thing is Laman was a um, previous salesperson high achieving salesperson who then you know got promoted and became a sales manager in her own right and she often tells this story about me because she had no choice in my hiring and her story is if if she had had a choice she wouldn't have hired me because i had no experience however having worked with me 
she would have slapped herself in the face basically mm-hmm. because it was like what the hell you know we we her and i were a, a team and we went from because i started in holloway and we went from holloway and we moved to regent's place together that's how i ended up at regent's place when she left she called for me to come over and i came over and at regent's place now i'm 25 years old i'm in sales um it's okay but i can't stop drawing I can't stop drawing. Like I draw all the time in my spare time. I'm on the phone talking to new customers. I'm doodling. And was I'm it just, everything? You're just drawing whatever came to mind, or were you still kind of this focusing time? On it was drawings? completely. It was completely undisciplined. I was just drawing whatever the hell I wanted to draw. Very yeah. self-indulgent. And um, I was coming up. I was 25, and I just remember thinking, like, I did my first job, right? Um, an ex-girlfriend of mine at the time. She was with a carnival band, and carnival's another thing that I loved doing. And this was how my love affair with carnival started. Not in Hill Carnival days. And um, she was with the carnival band and she was the costume designer for the band. And she had approached me and asked me um, to help her design some t-shirts for people to wear for 2008 carnival. So I'm like, okay, cool. You know, Um, I did three designs, loved them. And I was like, oh, I still got it. And then, you know, just as a token of appreciation, because it was an unpaid job, she had asked me to come to the carnival and see, you know, experience the carnival for the first time and also to see like all the people that had, because they sold out of t-shirts and I, you, you know, you'd never been it. to carnival before. Never then? been. I, oh, no, really? I've been, I've been twice. I've been twice okay. at different stages of life. I've been when I was really young, didn't appreciate it, scared the shit out of me. Um, I'd been the year before 2007, I went with my niece and she was really young and it scared the shit out of her. And as a result, I didn't have fun. But then this year, no kids. I'm old enough to get drunk and appreciate. It's also the first time I ever got drunk at 25. Um, <laughs> wow, amazing, amazing. Year of year of Just like an American. So, <laughs> right, so I've come, I've, right, I've come to I've come to this carnival uh, with two of my mates, and I remembered it was such an amazing experience. I, I recommend it if you ever if you haven't been. Not Hill Carnival is fantastic. It was such an amazing it. experience. It's, right, best time of the year in London. It was it was an amazing experience, and the the thing the cherry on top was seeing hundreds of people wearing something that i had designed so yeah so i mean yeah that's amazing though just like stopping for that there for a second right you'd you'd gone from writing these illustrations and getting some recognition from one of your professors um Mm -hmm. you kind of dropped it for a while and then suddenly in the real world at something you're immersed in you're seeing your art in the world in live in real time in in just happening and people people wearing the tops and enjoying themselves so i was just like this is amazing i want to feel this you know, again, yeah. and it stuck with me. And um, this is 08 now, 2008. And we come into 2009 and it just wouldn't leave me. It just would not leave me. And I remembered, I just, I transitioned. I moved to Regent's Place in October, 2008. And I just had a um, a conversation with my then um, gym manager, the general manager, you know, at the end of the year. And I just said to him, look, man, I don't want to do sales anymore. Like I, I want to, you know, go part-time and I want to become an artist. Like, and I want to learn what this thing is because again still not an illustrator not daring to call myself that you know so i was like i want to learn what illustration is i want to figure this out so when we hit march 2009 i went part-time um became a receptionist took a massive significant pay cut and started to patchwork together an education in illustration from any resource i could find online courses anything that i could afford because i couldn't afford to go back and study it properly so i had to patchwork together some sort of education and i just started to take on commission work in 09 i started to sort of try and experience as many different things as i could i did live art i you know drew tattoos i did anything that i could kind of put my mind to i did logos and then all the while, while I'm working, I'm also trying to learn the yeah. craft. I hit so many brick walls uh, when it came to the extent of my talent, like, cause talent can only take you so far, right? Like illustration, like any other creative thingy is a process of problem solving, yeah. right? So it's all about how you think. The amount of, the, the way that you draw is, is relevant, but it's not as relevant as how you think. And I bet you not going or being able to go back to kind of traditional education to teach yourself it helped you develop that skill set of like, how do I think about what I'm doing as well? Because you're problem solving for that at the same time. I had to figure shit out on my my own. So it it created a sort of independent spirit as well, because I wasn't depending on anybody to to get the answers I needed. Like I had to patchwork this thing together. The only downside is it takes so much longer to get to places so much longer but 
the upside of that is because it took so long to get somewhere, I appreciate that arriving at that destination so much more than anybody that got there quicker. That's right. Like, I just, I appreciate, I never take it for granted. That's beautiful. You know? I mean, what, what was going through your head at the time? Because, okay, so you clearly were inspired by what happened at Notting Hill Carnival, but to straight up tell your boss, yo, can I just like work part-time and pursue the, my, my art aspiration at the same time? That, like, that still requires a lot of bravery and courage. Did you think at the time, you know, I'm going to be a great artist, I'm going to do some great things, or did you think this is a side hobby that I'm taking more seriously that I'll start spending more time on? Like, what was going through your head? Were you completely into this long-term huge ambition, or were you like, let me try the art thing a bit now? Like, clearly the Notting Hill Carnival was a signal, but what was going through your head? It was the try the art thing. And the reasons I gave myself were I don't have any kids, I don't have anybody that's dependent on me. So if I'm going to do this thing right now is the time to do it, right? If I'm going to do it, it's going to be now. It's now or never. I'm 25 years old. You know, you get into that age, right? Where you have to kind of start making adult decisions. If not, if you're, if you're not already there, you have to get there. So like, you know, I'm like, I, I've got no kids. I've got no wife, nothing. There's no risks yeah. here. All the risks are very minimal. So if I'm going to take any risks, I'm gonna, you know, if I'm going to leap, let me leap down. And so I did, you know, and I'm at that stage. I still have no kids. I still have no wife. But <laughs> if were I to settle down as a, as, as a you know, to, to, go, to go into that other stage of life that you go into, were I to do that, I could do it so much more confidently than I could have back then, knowing that I'm doing it. And one of the things I used to say as well, these, these were my, my two little anecdotes that I would give when people ask me questions about it. Like I had people always come up to me whenever I was drawing in public and they'll be like, oh, what are you doing? You're drawing. I'm like, yeah, yeah, just drawing. Oh, this is brilliant. I used to draw and then I'd be like why did you stop do you know what I mean that would yeah. always be my thing I'd be like why did you stop and then I was like I never want to be that person mm -hmm. that comes up to some kid yes. in 10 years time he's like oh that's, that's really good that is I, I used to really enjoy doing, doing that yeah yeah I never want because that used to I, I never want to be that person so that was one of them I was just like yeah I just don't ever want to be that person you know, and I also wanted to be the person where if it failed, because there's no guarantee, if it failed, if I reached the end of my tether, which I almost did, if I reached the end of my tether and it just, it, I, I bomb, then I can at least say that I tried. Yeah. yeah, I'm really interested in like the role of, uh, in kind of role models in this as well, because you mentioned before that, you know, there were very limited, if any, black English illustrators at the time that you kind of could aspire to do works like them or to reach the kind of levels that they'd reached. You know, what was that like for you? And did you kind of look for role models elsewhere as a result? I looked, I was forced to look for role models elsewhere. Like, I mean, I just looked to the artists that were there, right? And a lot of people can turn around and say, well, you still had role models, you know, they didn't have to be black. And that's true. But the problem is, it makes it harder for you to connect those dots to yourself. Yeah. Right. You can appreciate illustration because you've got illustrators that you can look at, but you can only appreciate or really, truly appreciate sooner that you could possibly be one of those people when you see someone who looks like you in that position. Right. So that's that's an undeniable thing. As far as I'm concerned, that's an undeniable thing, because look at how long it took me versus how long it's taken others. Right. To, to get to connect those dots like and when I tell people my age they're always like what I'm like yeah I'm 37 years old so it's just like whatever they're like you don't look it I'm like oh I fucking feel it but, <laughs> but like but, but it, it, it is so much harder to connect those dots when you don't see anybody and also it's this crazy subconscious thing that's happening that you're not even aware of because it wasn't until I became an illustrator and I looked around and I saw disparity and I saw all those things. And I was like, wait a minute, this is why it fucking took so long because I couldn't, I, there was nobody I could talk to. Who could I talk to? Like, also, there's a level of understanding that's afforded to, 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 to me from another black person that a white person cannot possibly hope to aspire towards. It's, it's a mutual understanding that we have, right? And people, people, some people get funny when you talk about this because it's like, oh, but you know, you're all human beings. Nobody is saying that we're not all human beings. But the reality of it is black people sh have a shared lived experience that white people don't have with us. And we don't have that 
with other white people, mm-hmm. if that makes any sense. Like, y'all can have a shared experience as, as, as Caucasian men. You can have a shared experience that we don't have with you as, as, as you know, as black men. It's, it's a given fact of life. Why? Because we actually literally don't look alike. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, that, that common factor, that thread, if you will, that ties me to another black man isn't there for me with another white man. I have to find a different thread. Mm-hmm. Does that make any sense? I have to find a different thread. There's a thread that we have as men that I don't have with women, yeah. right? So like it's, uh, I can't remember the bloody name of this thing, but it's the degrees of um, separation, if you will, right, that apply. So like I'm going to be, I'm going to be more likely to relate to another black man before I can relate to a white man. But I'm also more likely to relate to a white man before I can relate to a, um, a, 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 a woman. And it just keeps going based on the things that we have in common, if it makes any sense. The higher, the, the more things we have in common, the higher the possibility of us being able to relate easily, almost bloody telepathically in some cases. Yeah, so, and I, wanna, I, wanna, I definitely really want to come back to this uh, in a little bit as well, because I know that, you know, some of the books you guys have, uh, have written, illustrated in, um, have been kind of taking social issues that you deem to be important and writing about them for children and so kind of making yeah. them you know, digestible for kids. Um, but maybe we could just quickly go back to, so you, you decided to go part-time. Um, you were so illustrating half the time. Second, that was the second key pivotal stage of all of this stuff, right? So this is when I decided to become an artist and just go for it and see what was good. So fast forward, we're going to jump ahead. Um, 10 years later, um, I've gone from in the early stages of this in 2016 just after we would had the whole art in the square thing um i've never voiced this to you so you don't know this but i have said it to other people but um i was in a really in a rut like a, a bit of a shit space um and i say that because there wasn't anything particularly horrible happening to me but i had been going at this speed with my art and my career for such a long time at that point, right? Mm-hmm. So it had been um, 2016, it had been six years at the time I've been going at it. So one of the things is I was incrementally but slowly moving forward, mm-hmm. right? Never moving backwards, just moving forward, occasionally sideways, but you know, Sorry. moving forward. How, how do you measure that? Go ahead. Like, how did you, like, okay, six years, that's a long time. And, and of course we can't get into every single day of that six year period, but like, what would you mm-hmm. consider progress? Is it like, each month you saw that people loved it more, you know, what I was, so this is what I was going to go into next. Right. So what I would consider progress. Right. Um, So the the beautiful thing about art, and, you know, I explain this to people, people who don't understand how we make money. Right. Every single time a person buys a piece of work from me, right. A few things happen. They buy the work and either they gift the work, which means another person gets to discover my work and then become a fan. Right or they display the work, which also means whoever sees the work becomes a potential fan, right? This way, there's almost no cap, no limit to how far my work could possibly go, right? There's almost no limit. That's how I like to think about it. And also, the great thing, Anthony mentioned buying a print from me. Anthony bought this print in 2016, you know, when I illustrated that piece of work in 2010. That piece of work from 2010 still sells today. And all I have to do to make the 40 pounds that I sell the print for is, um, is click a button yeah. which says print. And all people have to do is go online. That's the beauty of art. You can make work from way back and it still sells. Every time somebody clicks a button, buys a book, your work sells, right? So going back to answer your question, um, I noticed that. I saw that my, my sort of fan base was growing. The type of people that were buying my work was growing. It was growing, I could see that, I could feel that, but the thing that I found that was frustrating was that I always seemed to be breaking even. At the Mm -hmm. time, at the gym, I was working on average maybe a day, two days a week, right? So for the money I was getting, because it was minimum wage, I was averaging about 500 pounds a month from my paycheck at the gym. And I had to supplement that with artwork commissions and selling prints and doing pop-ups and events and stuff, right? And on average, on a good month, I'd make about a grand, right? On a terrible month, which there were more of than the good month, I'd be taking home about 600 pounds a month, right? I found just so many different ways of hustling the system 
at my workplace. So like I, I would do a thing where like I sold, we had a subsidized gym membership or a free gym membership that we could make available to somebody. I'm saying this now because no one can, you know, <laughs> so I, I sold mine and I took, I took, I took like 40 pounds. I took like 40 pounds a month from a friend of mine and he bought it and he was able to use the gym as and when he wanted to and he paid me right so i supplemented my wage in those kinds of ways and what i was noticing was again you know i i I just wasn't moving as quickly as my peers for example so like i've got friends who are like 10 years younger than me and they're working obviously everyone's life trajectory is different but you can't help but notice these things so like they're working jobs where they're getting paid like stupid money like really great money and i'm happy for them but i'm also looking at myself and thinking fuck man how are you going to be able to afford to live the life that you kind of not and it wasn't a fancy life i wanted to live but it was just to live london living you cannot survive on 600 pounds a month Mm -hmm. right so um you know, all of this stuff was bugging me. And also I'm coming up to, at the time it was 2016, I was 23, I'm 33 years old. And I'm coming up to my mid thirties and I'm like, shit, man. Like I was, I was panicking. I was like, what's, what's going to happen? And also if you look at my CV, because I've been part-time at this gym job, right. For so long since like, I've been part-time since 09. Right. So that's seven years at the time I've been part-time working as a receptionist. What other job am I qualified to do on my CV, right? Mm-hmm. So say I leave the gym, where am I going? What am I doing? I can only get like another reception job. And also, as Anthony knows, working at that gym for so long meant I could take certain liberties that I would never be able to take if I was starting new at another job. I would never be able to have a gallery of my work up. You know, I wouldn't be able to sell my prints in, in the gym, you know? So it was this, this really tricky space that I found myself in where I was thinking, what's next? And also the thing about that gym is, I make myself indispensable at any job I do. So I could do several different roles at the gym, right? I knew how to run the floor. I knew how to do several different roles, even PT, and I could do it if I wanted to, right? But I just wasn't qualified for those roles. So I was the person in the gym where they would call me to do certain things, but on paper, I'm not qualified for those roles. So I can't take that and spin it into a job if that makes any sense. So I was in this really sticky place in 2016. Now in 2016, I'd also signed up with my agent, who's a lady called Sally Ann. She's my agent agent for four years now. And I'd already signed up with her through Nathan because Nathan is a very talented and accomplished screenwriter, right? So at the time he was an actor on this show called Benadorn. And he was with an agency that merged with a literary agency. So Nathan and I had been working on our little book and I'd been illustrating the character at the time. And he took this, um, my work in and his pitch to the literary arm of the agency. She called me in and I signed up with her in October, 2016. And I just remembered signing and just thinking, yeah, whatever, whatever happens, what, what have I got to lose, you know? And um, I'm gonna jump a few steps here. So she took the book out, did her thing at Bologna. We got the book deal. Fast forward to like 2018, I'm a signed illustrator. I've got this book deal, it's made a lot of noise. People know who I am in the industry. I'm getting a lot of people kind of just emailing me stuff and just making connections and trying to learn the industry. And this was when I discovered that I am one of, at the time, two black illustrators in the whole of the UK children's publishing industry. Really? I was like, yeah, I was like, what the fuck? This is weird. So between me, just to give you, I remember I told you I'm 37, right? Just to give you some idea of it, between me and the other guy, there's 34 years of work, right? He'd been in the industry for 34 years prior to me coming in. Wow. So he started working when I was three years old. And between me and him, there was no one else. That's a messed up situation, wow. right? So I've come into this industry now. And what some people might have perceived as a great thing, oh, yeah, you're, you're, you're a novelty in the industry. And, you know, as a result, because I was getting offered work for left, right, and center, and I still am, right? Um, we were averaging at the time, March 2018, we were averaging about three offers of book, book work, right? like well-paid book work a week, right? A week? Now, wow. yeah, we were averaging that a week, right? Then it slowed down a bit after I'd filled all my, um, my, filled my quota. It slowed down a bit. But what I did was, because at the time I thought one book job does not an illustrator make, right? So like after we got our first deal, I was keen to get enough to warrant me not having to go back to working at any other job, right? Yeah. And at the time I have to mention that the gym closed in 2018, right? For good. Like, so I would have been out of the job (laughs) regardless of what happened, right? So I was very fortunate that we signed our book deal in 2017 and I worked at the gym till it closed, 
I didn't quit my job. Right? I went down to one day a week and I stayed at the gym till it closed. Free gym membership, you know. So um, my 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 third and sort of final for this for the sake of this podcast transitional moment happened after I learned about those statistics. And what happened was I shifted from having a career as just a children's book illustrator to becoming somebody who was a voice for getting other black talent into the industry, right? That became a real key and pivotal part of what it is that I do, which has led to the book that I'm now working on, which is going to be a vehicle. I'm going to tell you exactly how, because I can't talk about it yet, but it is a vehicle that I'm trying to use to further that cause. And um, it also led to me kind of understanding how for such a long time visual artists in in the world at large in the creative industry visual artists they i think they get treated like shit like to, to kind of for a different for, for the sake of a different way of phrasing they get treated like shit like I, I just don't understand it there's this kind of weird disconnect that happens that you know with the publishing industry where you know you need our work to make your shit look good right but you don't pay us as much as you could pay us and you also don't credit us when it comes to you showing the work authors always get a bigger you know platform and a bigger push from publishers than illustrators and that puzzles me especially when it comes to children's picture books having done three picture books myself i know how much an illustrator puts into a picture book that narrative isn't the same narrative that they receive once they finish with it at all there's so much that illustrators add to picture books that that the author could not possibly add or envision so I don't understand why equal billing isn't given. Why, right? why do you think when that you is? Look at a picture, it's a traditional thing. It's something, you know, like, like a lot of things in this country, it's something that's been going on for ages that nobody's ever questioned or challenged or changed that have been allowed, it's been allowed to become normalized. So now we're in a different generation. We're in a different space. We're in a different space in society where people have the language to articulate the frustration that people weren't able to, you know, explain before. And even now, like, um, I recently had an incident with the BBC where they showed our work and they didn't credit me. And I went off. And I was like, I'm not having that. Like, you can't, you know, Nathan and I are, we won this award. We won the Waterstones Children's Book Prize. And we won it together, right? We won it for the best illustrated book category. What the fuck? How are you going to display yeah. that and not mention me? It's a the fucking illustrator. illustrator. Duh. Like, so <laughs> I was like, I'm not having that. I'm not having any of that. So I wrote an open letter. I wrote an open letter to the media at large. And we now, we're at like something like 850 signatures on the letter. And, you know, I, I wrote this letter and it was about credit and artists for their work. It was about the frustration that I felt at having that happen to me and what's happened since is that people have come forward and given me accounts people who have been in this industry for years like years people who i looked up to in the industry they're like you know what that i normalized it and you're absolutely correct i shouldn't have had to like you know when we talk about mental health it's something that we love to talk about so much right now and for for um very valid reasons right but when we talk about mental health we don't i feel like we don't attach it to certain people we pick and choose who we can attach it to, if it makes any sense. Now, imagine what it does to your mental health as an artist, putting so much of your time and energy into a product, and every single time it gets brought up in a positive light, you your name gets dropped out. Mm. You don't get mentioned. This is the primary reason why I absolutely fucking refuse to work on any celebrity author books. I'm not doing that. Interesting. Because the celebrity author always supersedes near, near enough and everybody. Like the illustrator, you'll see it. So Paul McCartney, his name's huge, and then illustrated by Depo Adiola. Yeah. It's really fucking tiny. Like, fuck off. Like, I'm not doing that. Like, I understand why they do it. I do yeah. get it, right? But surely the marketing teams, like, this is this is where we don't, we don't, I, I feel like this is where they're not thinking properly. This is where even Paul McCartney's not thinking properly because you didn't draw that book. It's an illustrated book. Yes, your name is the name that is selling the book, but you also worked on that with someone. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like this person worked on that book, you know, and what kind of jerk are you? And I'm just going to get a bit heated when I, what I'm about to say, but it's the truth of it. What kind of jerk are you if you allow that to happen? I could never do that. Like my, you know, for want of a better, because I hate this saying, but for want of a better phrase, my celebrity is rising. Mm. 
right? My star is rising in this in this world that I'm in at the moment. And I know that this my first book as an author won't be my last book as an author. I want to work with illustrators. And whenever I work with an illustrator, I'm going to give them an equal billing, equal platform, equal everything. It's 50-50. I might even fucking sign an agreement with them saying this because I just don't, I don't want to do that. It can be done properly. So I just don't understand why, you know, why, why it's been allowed to be done this way for so long. I think, I think we live in a world where standing for something is more value than ever before because it shows a certain level of authenticity and trust in the fact that, you know, clearly what you just said, you're not like reading off some corporate comms uh, press release that some PR consultant gave you. This is how you truly feel about the world. And I think that's super valuable now. And that's what people love and want to hear now. So I think you're just at the tip of what is going to be hopefully a change in the way creative industries work. Because I mean, whether you're talking about visual art, whether you're talking about music, whether you're talking about you know, and anything in, in the creative industries, there's, there's so much, there's so much like in, in some ways like structural uh, messes and, and broken systems in, in the world of creativity and art that hopefully you can be one person that changes that. I tell you what, if it happens, it happens. Honestly, it won't be for lack of me trying, yeah. but one of the things just for myself, for my own sanity, I'm trying not to, because these things can quickly become a distraction from you actually doing the thing that you love doing. Right. And at the moment, I think I've garnered a reputation in the industry for being quite combative when it comes to these things. And, um, you know, it's, it's not a problematic thing, but people know that I'm going to speak up on something. But I also don't want to, and this is where it goes back to what I said earlier about um, allowing these conversations about representation and empowerment to deviate from the work that you're doing. I'm still an illustrator. I still have books to put out. I still have things that I need to do. So I need to kind of have that beautiful balance, which I think I've got, of speaking up on these things and actioning things that can help change the landscape, but also still drawing and doing the thing that I love doing. You know, so I'm trying to, again, what I try to do is, as with this book I've, I've just written, I try to use the books to make the change, right? Like I've, I'm in talks, you know, this book, I'm, I've not just written it. I'm actually very hands-on on the editing, curating, all these other aspects of it, even the marketing, which is very unusual. And I had to have, before I started writing this book, I had to sit down with the heads of department at the publisher I'm working with is Puffin. The Puffin, it's the biggest fucking children publisher in the world, Penguin Random House. It's, I had a sit down with them and the CEO of Penguin Random House, I sit down with her in the UK and I, you know, I, I talked to her and I said to her, look, I'm doing this book, but I want to do it differently. You guys have tasked me with writing this particular story and I want to do it differently. And if we're going to do this book, I need to have the backing of the publisher in terms of allowing me to have access to the marketing team and sit down with them about the strategy that I want them to use when selling this particular book, because it's a very sensitive book. It's about black lives. Mm. You know, I'm not going to say yeah. matter. It's about is it, black is it, lives. Is it, a, is it a children's book? It's a children's book. Yeah. yeah. And again, that's why it's sensitive because you don't get children's books in this day and age. You get one or two now that are coming through, obviously after June's events, you know, BLM and all that stuff, you get books that are coming through now. But it, it's, it's a rare thing. It's still a very early mm -hmm. days kind of thing to get books that come through that talk about black lives the way that this book is going to be talking about it. I'm, I'm really intrigued about the kind of creative process behind taking a really complex social issues and kind of disseminating them into a children's book. Like, what does that look like when you're thinking about creating one of these kinds of books? I have no idea. <laughs> and the reason, I can, the, reason, the, reason, the reason I'm saying I have no idea is because yeah. I have yet to see what this is going to do, you know? Like, again, this is, you guys, are, you guys are the first people getting the skinny on what I'm writing. Nobody else. I've never mentioned this publicly to anybody. So this is the first time I'm saying it. Even as I'm saying it, I'm thinking, oh, shit, my publisher's going to have something to say. <laughs> to say We're live, by the way, broadcasting gonna, the whole world right now. So Yeah, this well, is... <laughs> well, it's out now. But, you know, also, it's... it's um. It's not easy. That's the one thing I'll say. It's not easy. There's a lot of things that you have to think about, you know, um, and, and more, more times it's not even the things I have to think about. I'm not thinking about them with regards to children's ability to understand. Right. I don't I don't doubt that children can understand. I'm not, you know, selling children short. What I am thinking is within the restraints that the publishing industry gives me the box that I'm in that I have to tell this story within. 
for it to be something that they can conf confidently publish. Yeah. That's what was difficult, right? Telling a story to kids ain't hard. You tell a story, kids will have questions, you answer the questions, right? Kids are always going to have questions, and the more questions, the better, right? That's not the hard part. The hard part is giving the publishing industry something that they as adults understand how to sell. That's the hard part, right? So this, this is the thing that's always baffled me about this industry. We're doing this thing for children, but so much adult interference occurs before it right. ever reaches the child, right? Like it, it's trippy as it's trippy as balls, mate. It's absolutely trippy. Like I just, it, I just, I can't get my head around that. Like so much adult interference happens before a book reaches the child, right? Like even when we're talking about book reviews, right? There are people that make a whole thing reviewing books. That's their business. That's what they do. That's their bread and butter. And they're adults. You know, have you ever been on Goodreads? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's hell. It's hell. <laughs> Like it's 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 the hellscape of of lit, of the literacy world. Like I just don't people on book on Goodreads. Like there's a whole thing. Like people can earn a living reviewing books on that site. And I look at it like that's that's weird to me. That's really weird to me. Like where's the joy? You know? Because we I went on Goodreads and I read a review of Look Up and I I shit you not man. I came so close to switching and going nuts on that person and finding out who they were and hunting them down because <laughs> it was. The, it was the only it was it was the it was the only bad review that I had allowed myself to read. I'm sure there are a couple more out there, but it was so bad that you know this person was angry at the book. Like really angry at the book. You're a fucking adult. Why are you angry at a children's book? How does that make any sense? Like it was never for you. And and without having read Look Up myself, like what what was it about? And what were they angry about? Um you know what? I'm gonna find this review. I'm read it out real quick, because that's the only way I can do this. Because, like, I can't um, to, to sum it up. God, to sum it up, right? Because they wrote some stuff. I'm gonna find it, and I'm gonna take a screenshot of it this time. Because, yeah. Um, <laughs> let me see. Because the way that they, yeah, the way that they went in on this, it was just like, whoa. Right, so I'm on Goodreads right now. Isn't this like a tactic, like, you know, like it's just like looking at Twitter comments and replies where there's a lot of toxic stuff there where as, as you naturally build a bigger brand, you need to kind of insulate yourself from ways right. like, I mean, you know, you see like Tar Charlie D'Amelio, the famous TikToker, I think she like, she got so much hate for some video she put out last week, but she like talked about how like depressed she was, how she's thinking of like just giving it all up. And this is like, a uh, a horrible thing you know she's like 16 years old and people who are in the public i have to deal with this kind of stuff so as you become more a public figure uh i while this, we should still stop yeah, screenshotting yeah we should still, well. maybe we can still read out if you want to but maybe we should just like ignore a lot of these people right a lot of these voices oh dude i'm, I'm definitely going to oh, i can't find this. i'm definitely going to you know after this yeah i'm just yeah. like yeah. Nah, Don't I'm all right. Um, oh, where is this bloody review? It should be here, man. I've got the two star review. Oh, here it is. Here oh, it is. Here we go. Right, all right. So she writes, she, first of all, she puts all these exclamation marks up, right? And then she writes, You could have a drinking game for every time this book uses the above symbol. That's the exclamation marks, right? We've got a look up is a big explanation mark in the title. And then she goes on to write, and if I had a dollar for, for every recently published book about an African-American girl that references Mae Jameson, she's not African-American by the way, I could buy a nice bottle of sangria at Costco unless I wanted each book to be a good book because it has almost become a red flag to me when I pick up a book. This is preachy, still talking about our book. This is preachy and by the way, you can use that cell phone to get a compass app or a tracking app from NASA, both of which would have been useful here and absolutely banal. It's also not realistic because as a lifelong city dweller, I can tell you that there is too much ambient light in the city, even in the park, to see stuff like this. In our book, the girl goes looking for a meteor shower, right? Um, then she goes on to write, I'd have seen the Perside meteor showers by now, if you could. And even under the best of circumstances, you have to do this late, late in the night. She ain't stopped. She goes, an extra for the illustrator's nonsense about how he creates art that challenges 
assumptions about gender, race, and ethnicity in a fun and upbeat way. That's me she's talking about. Um, perhaps that's what he does in his unpublished work, but there's no challenge here except to guess which computer software he uses to create utterly whole hum art like this. As my assistant, a truly talented, she's not finished. As my assistant, a truly talented artist commented, whenever you give me a pile of picture books to look at, five or six of them look like this. And that's, that's the review on my work. She gave it one star. So, and, and she went on to write mediocre writing, overrated picture book. That was the review. So I read this and I'm going to screenshot this right now actually, because I want, I want to keep this. I read this and I just remember thinking, yeah, I'm not buying it. You're an adult and you sound like you hate a picture book. That's fucking weird on any That's level. That's on something strange there. That is Right, right. And your assistant, who's a truly talented artist, if they are a fucking truly talented artist and they have this view on children's books, why are they not illustrating? Why have I never heard of your assistant? <laughs> That's weird, man. That's really weird. It, that is really weird. hella weird. It's hella weird. And this person went out of their way to shit on the book. And that's, that's where I'm just like, it's not about the book anymore. There's something wrong with you. So, so okay, Let, you let's know? say you, you take this, um, and like, like what I was saying a few minutes ago, like, I mean, as, as you continue in your career, and same for everyone, you're going to have people who react to you that way. Do you take this 100%. as like, like, you know, you, you may print out a picture of it, put it on your wall, throw darts at it, punch it in the morning as like motivation, or you just ignore it? Like, oh, what's no, you, no, what, no, no, How do you no, no. internalize this, this? particular one, this particular one, I'm keeping it because I want to keep it, because this is the only bad review I've ever read about a book. I'll be real. So I want to keep this as, as, a, as a reminder of this particular review, yeah. right? And it's not, it's not so much, I'm, I'm even removing our book about from, from this, right? This is an example of somebody who should not be reviewing children's books. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on that people aren't acknowledging in the industry regarding who gets to have a say on things. Yeah. And this is an example of somebody who clearly should not be fucking reviewing children's books. Yeah. <clears throat> Having a say on things. So that's why I'm going to keep this. When it comes to actual bad press about the book, man, I just don't care. I, yeah. I don't care enough. Like, and I'm not saying that just for cool points or anything. Like, I can't, I've never been that person who another person's opinion of me matters so much that it dictates the path that I'm taking, right? The book we're about to put out next year, fucking hell, we are going to get a backlash on that book, right? It's going to happen. I know it's going to happen. I'm expecting it to happen, right? And I don't know if you follow me on Twitter, Anthony, but I'm ready for those conversations. Like, yeah. if, you, if you come at me, I'll come at you just as hard. It's not a problem for me at all. Like, because what I want you to do is just say you're racist. Just say it. <laughs> just say it. Like, just say it. Just own it. Because there's no other reason why you're piping up, right? Just say it. Just say it. Say it with your chest. Yeah. And, and once you say it with your chest, then we can have the real discussion, right? Hiding behind shit, I'm not for that. Just say it. Say it with your chest. Say it. Because there's no other reason why you're picking apart a book. She talked about an African American girl. The references. This person is not black. And I just know that there's, they've got a funny picture up, as people tend to do that comment that make these kind of comments, right? But I just know this person's not black. I know you're not black. And the fact that you've picked that out, why are you even picking up this particular book? Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, why are you picking up this book? It's not for you. Like, it's crazy. Like, I'm gonna go and review an LGBTQ book and, and talk about it. It's not fucking for me. Yeah. Like, what the hell am I supposed to get from that book? Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna write a bad review about it. What the fuck? Like that just, just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So I'm here for that. If you want to come at me with that, I'm here yeah. for that. Let's, let's do that. Let's have that conversation. Well, if, if Anthony isn't already following you on Twitter, you've got two new follows coming yeah. up. <laughs> can't, no, can't it's, wait. It's, it's an exciting time on my Twitter feed, man. It's an exciting <laughs> time. That, that app, is that app is the best app and i say that app is the best app because when you use it for what it's supposed to be used for which is to have these kind of conversations to get things moving i think it yields amazing results like i think it yields, re yields absolutely amazing results and i don't think there's any other app like it yet i'm not as app savvy as you guys probably are but i haven't seen another app that's like twitter for, for, for initiating change yeah you know I think it's, it's definitely underrated. I'm trying to invest more of my time on Twitter. Um, where should people find you, by the way? So, I mean, I think we're, um, we're aware of what's going to happen next, at least from your project, they're able to talk about. But 
if yeah, someone listening to this right now... Are we able to get a title for that one, Dapo? Yeah, what I'll else give you that. I, okay. I feel like I've already given you <laughs> way too much. I was, uh, I was trying to figure out how to talk about it without talking about it. But like the reason why I can even give you what I've given you, to be honest with you, is because I think given how I am and who I am in the industry at the moment, I think it's to be expected that my first book as an author would be about black black lives and, and all the rest of it. So I think I can safely say that. But I think people are still in for, for a surprise when it comes to the type of book that I've chosen to write like it's it's not going to be what people might necessarily think it's going to be right and um it's due out next summer so that's another thing I can tell you um it will be announced hopefully as books tend to be announced roughly six months before they're out it will be announced early next year so that's another thing I can tell you so look out for that and you need that title I can't give you the title it will <laughs> you, you'll 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 see it in, in about <laughs> what we're, we're what last week of november now yep yeah less, less than two months man you'll you'll have that title like you'll be there but um yeah it's gonna be good cool. it's gonna be good and, and where should right. people find you should people find you on twitter um, personal website i have the same i have the same handle i don't have a personal website that's another crazy thing about my life right now i actually don't have a website i'm small i was supposed to have one two years ago i just couldn't be asked and i it, not to sound cocky but i just it would be a waste of internet space right now to have a website. Yeah, yeah. So um, you can find me at that straws, that's D A P S D R A W S. And that's my handle for Twitter and Instagram. So at cool. that straws, um, Instagram, if you want some nice pictures and sort of tidbits of my artwork to look at, that's the best place for that. If you want artwork and my loud mouthed opinion, then Twitter <laughs> is the best place. And I, I think we have more of a, that's if you want to engage, if you want to engage more, Twitter is definitely the best one. Like you, you get to see more of the full picture on Twitter than you do on Instagram. Pardon the expression. That's a weird, yeah, it's weird analogy. And, and you also, you also mentioned you're always working on new projects. Um, you know, who do you want to get in touch? Is there anyone you're looking to create with? No, no, at the moment, honestly. And I say that because <laughs> to give you to give you an example of my workload, I'm currently working across five different publishers. And I've just finished my, I finished what would be my sixth book and I'm working on my seventh, eighth, ninth and 10th and 11th at the moment. So I'm working on like five books at the moment. How, how does that work? I'm working with some, like, I don't do you, know. I, okay. When I know, I'll let you know. Because, okay. Go on, go on. Do I, do no, I, work? I, I just like, I just don't know. Like, let's say, I'm just like really curious and maybe like probably the podcast can like, like we'll edit all this stuff. But I'm just curious, like if you have five books going on, is that like, just like working on five projects at once. Like, I know you spend day one on book one, book A, Tuesday you work on book B and they all have similar timelines. You all put it up saying like, it, how does that work, you know? So it doesn't work. And um, <laughs> you, would, you would wish, you would want it to be like, you work on five books here and five books there. But what it ends up being is, for me anyway, because again, I'm still very new to this and I'm actually still learning how to be a children's book illustrator. That's another thing that I didn't, my, you know my work before this, it wasn't what it is now, right? So like I'm learning how to illustrate books. I'm learning how to not only illustrate according to what I know, but push for each book. Mm -hmm. So I'm juggling that. Like I'm currently doing a course on color and light at the same time as illustrating wow. this book that I'm doing at the moment. So, um, it doesn't work is what I'm trying to say to you. Like I'm trying to figure out how to do it properly. So what I've ended up doing now is I work on one book at a time. So like I'll spend a week on this book, work it all the way up to a point where I can submit work to the publisher for them to get feedback. And while they're doing the feedback on that, I'll jump on the other book. So sometimes, yeah, so sometimes a book is gathering dust for ages and publishers are really on my neck about it. But one thing I learned is Publishers are happy once you give them something. You have to just give them something. So I'll spend like, you know, three or four days because you need three or four days on a book to get a good, build up a good kind of, you know, pace. Mm -hmm. And I'll spend about three or four days on a particular book. Then I'll drop it and jump on to the next one. I'm in the draft stage for about four of the books at the moment. And I'm doing work that I really love for, for all of them. Um, and once I submit the draft work, good. Is, is it uh, like it, the way that you build them up? Are you building up like 10 pages with full color to finish? Or do you do the sketch work first, <coughs> submit that, sketch, then add color? Draft, draft work first. So yeah, right. I, 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 do, I do draft work first and some color samples so that they can have an idea of what the finished work would look like. And that helps them join those dots. 
to understand what the draft work is going to look like. Yeah, right, right, right. So for one of the books, the picture book I'm working on, I've done, um, I finished the first draft, I'm doing the second draft now, but I've also, off the back of the first draft, done some color um, examples. So they know what finished, they've got finished samples, so they know what the finished work is going to look like, right? right? So now I'm cleaning up the second draft so that once they've approved and signed off on that, all I have to do now is color that in. That's the, first, that's the second and final pencil draft. And now they'll leave me alone to just do color work, right? And color work can take about a month to get done fully, right? And that's what I'm hoping. I get the whole of December to finish this book. Um, and, and that's the same or a similar process for all the books. So currently I'm working on two picture books, one fiction book and um, a book cover. And then my own book as an author and an illustrator. Yeah. Right. And, and it, so, uh, for, the, for the four or five that you're working on right now, is the, these are um, like ideas you've had or are you co-creating with, uh, is it Nathan you, you mentioned before? So um, <laughs> one of the picture books is with an author I can't name. Um, and again, when you find out who this person is, I don't know how much you know about UK literature, but she, she, uh, they are very, <laughs> um, almost, almost, you almost got me there. I heard they you. are very, they are <laughs> very, very well-known, very significant author you know, in, in the UK um, publishing world. And that, that for me will be either a career changing or a career defining book when it comes out, hopefully. I've got my fingers crossed. I love what I'm doing at the moment. And I hope that, you know, the world receives it as intended. Um, so with that, she's written that. I've said it, she's written that. Um, and, you know, that's her, her book, her idea. And I've come on and I've added my two pence. I'm fortunate enough that this person has given me the liberty of being able to really put my touch on this. And I love this. I love that we've done that. Like there's so much more to this particular book, which I'll get to talk about when, when it gets mm -hmm. announced. But until then, this is what I can tell you. It's going to be, hopefully it's going to be the game changer that I hope it will be. Um, and then there is a book I'm working on, which is book two in the series that I did with, um, an author named Swapna Hadal. Swapna is a South Asian author, um, and this is book one in the series. This oh, was nice. supposed to come out this year. This was supposed to come out this year, but it didn't because of COVID. Um, it's now coming out April next year, and I'm currently working on the second book in the series. Hey, your, your name is just as big as the your name yeah. is just as big as the author's name on that. Right. So this is what I mean when I talk about equal yeah. feeling. It, it, it's not clear who wrote it or who illustrated it. That's, that's not a really good point. Is. It's yeah. a collaborative project between the two of us. Right. So like if you look at like book one of Look Up, right, it says by Nathan Brian, yeah. illustrated by Dak Guardiola. Right. Yeah. So book two in the series, Clean Up, I got them to change that. And it now oh. says just our name. I love that. Nice. Hell yeah! You got some sway in that. That's awesome. it's a it's a small touch, but it's a very significant touch. No, but because... that's significant for you as a creator. Yeah, and it's also significant when people are talking. It should be when people are talking about the book that they should be saying, you know, this person and that person. And and what we're trying to do is, and it will happen hopefully in my career lifetime. We are trying to get people to change the language they use when they're talking around picture books. It shouldn't be written by and illustrated by. It. You know, yeah, yes, you can, sense. yes, you can talk about that. Yes, definitely, you can say who drew it, and who wrote it. But when you're introducing it, make sure that you are making people understand that it is a collaborative process between two people. Co-created is the term that you should be using. Hey, I have a question as well, right? So you, you, it took you 13 years from that pivotal moment at age like what, coming into age 25. Um, mm. Was it 13 years or 18? Was it 13 or 18? One well, of the two. 12, 12 to get, yeah, to get here. To get here, right, from that time when you're like, hey, now or never. Mm. So 12 mm. years from now, what does this look like for, for you? Uh, oh, that's a good question. 12 years from now. So this is what's wild. I can tell you this. So this is what's wild. I've recently done my first um, stint as a character designer for development on Warner Bro with Warner Brothers Animation. Wow. So that's now brought me into the world of animation. Yeah. And I'm about to go on a stint with Disney um, as a character designer as well. So I forgot to mention, oh, apart, huge. From five, apart from five books, I'm also drawing cartoon characters, which is great. Um, 
Not only so, for but for Disney as well. That's a mate. That's that's huge. That's the biggest it gets, dude, right? Dude, I didn't even go looking. They came knocking, and it was mad. Like I, I I'll tell that story another day. But oh. it was mad. So both. I, I can tell it now. Wait for the, the first Disney film with you having drawn the main character. Dude, I'm if because the thing I've learned about animation is not everything you do. Um, sees the light of day sometimes things live in purgatory forever and you know occasionally projects get picked up and get made and then you're lucky so i'm hoping that the one that i did warner brothers does see the light of day and i will get to work with them on the production but i've done some character designs for the development um stage of it the pitch and the disney one i'm not sure exactly what stage that's in whether it's in production or not but um we'll see but I've got that job coming as well. And both of these companies came knocking. I was not looking to get into animation for a hot minute. And both of them came knocking. So I said no to Disney the first time. Yeah, first two what? times I said no to them. Said no so to crazy. Disney. You know you're so not allowed crazy. to do that. <laughs> Dude, that's why that's why they couldn't that's why they couldn't be a third no. I said no to Disney twice, which then made me say yes to Warner Brothers. And then Disney came knocking again and I was like, okay, nah it doesn't matter what you're doing it doesn't matter how much you burn out just say yes so i said yes and um i'm excited about this particular project i can't talk about it again but i am super fucking excited about this this is right up my street which is another reason why i said yes and um you know what, what i'm trying to do in answer to your question i'm trying to build these relationships because what it does is it opens up the world for me going forward the potential is almost infinite in the creative industry right now when it comes to working in animation or working in books um things again are going to change when i become an author right i'm also going to be an author now i'm also going to be an illustrator it's um one of the projects i'm doing next year and the projects i'm doing this year i've made the decision to be more hands-on and more involved like so i'm curating co-editing a project that we've got that's going to come out next year that, that, that's going to be announced next year as well so that puts i'm wearing different hats and my grand plan is something that i've always had from the beginning which is at some point in this whole thing maybe in the next it might happen a lot sooner because things tend to happen a lot sooner than i planned but in the next decade or so because again 37 coming into like my 40s soon and that'll be another decade of life and i want that to be a very different decade for me as a creative i want to be an owner in that decade and when i say an owner i mean somebody who owns the lion's share of whatever it is that i'm putting out because it gives me that creative control not because i want to stunt or be the big boss but because it gives me that creative control to not have my voice watered down in any way whatsoever right so that's my goal and how i'll achieve that well i'm trying to stay away from that kind of that kind of thing because I, I have mixed fe i even have mixed feelings about the capitalistic aspect of the capitalist aspects of what it is that i'm doing right now right so like it's trying to figure out how to and it is i think it's possible how can you be an ethical um ethically successful capitalist mm -hmm. can you be is it possible yeah and I, I think, think it, i think it is i think, I think you can, you can. I need the I money to make have the sway to bring your vision into being. So right, I think I you think can. So. I think you definitely can. But I also think that this is my thing. I, I never want to be a billionaire, for example. That's not my goal. I don't think billionaires should exist. I just don't like. I just, I feel like that you're hoarding. Like, look at the disparities in the world. Right, we're going off on a tangent, but I'm going to come back. But I feel like. I just don't ever want to be that. Like if, even if I end up at that because a particular thing I did becomes so crazy successful, I'll give away enough money to take that zero off. So I'm no longer a billionaire, you know, because I don't need that to, to live on this. I don't fucking need that. Who needs that? Right. So, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like if I'm a 500 millionaire, I'm cool, but dude, what the hell, what, what else do I possibly need? Yeah, that's pretty cool. Right. That is pretty what cool. else do I possibly need? Like even that, that's like, Jesus, like you, you, you're never going to spend that in your lifetime. Like, and you know, wh what else do I need? So that's my thing. I never want, that's why it's, when we talk about empire, I'm like, yeah, let's cut that motherfucker up and split it so that other people can have a chance. Right. I, um, I would love uh, the next Mickey Mouse to be one of your creations. It'd be, uh, it, I would love be, that kind it, of it, character, it, that kind of gravitas, all of the creative. Iconic. Well, I'll tell, I, I tell yeah. you one thing. 
Like Rocket has the potential, the character for our picture book. She has the potential. It's been optioned. It's actually going to be made into an animated series. So she has the the potential Wait, to be. That's confirmed. It's it's going to become an animated series. Is that another scoop well, that you it's just? It's been optioned. Okay. It's been optioned. So when something is optioned, as I've come to learn, it means that the potential for it to be made is there. So a studio has bought the right okay. to make it, basically. Okay. So what they're doing at the moment is they're having talks with people like Disney, Sky, HBO Max, these kind of companies to see if they want to take it and, you know, make it into a thing. So that's so fascinating. Like what, what constitutes something that can be optioned? Is it that the, that character is particularly compelling? Is it that they're multifaceted and they can do lots with it? Like how does a character it has to, have, it, has to, it has to have appeal, right? So the, the appeal has to be there so that whoever wants to put their money down to option it, can see the potential for it going on to becoming something other than what it is. And that's what happened with the studios that wanted to option look up. We were, we had about four offers for that, right? So it was decent, like it was, you know, there was potential and people, and, and you know, as, as it's been optioned, um, it went to a small studio in the UK and they've gone out to get partners to help them put more money into it so that they can approach big networks right and every time every conversation that we've had around it has been a positive conversation where somebody's keen to hear more about it right so like you know again those those companies i mentioned those networks i mentioned it wasn't a coincidence they are all networks that are potentially interested in having this property so we're just waiting to see and all of this all of this is a journey all of this mm. is a learning opportunity because i don't know exactly verbatim what it is that I want to do later on but I do know that it involves being in control of the narrative right and in order to be in control of the narrative you have to learn the different ends of things I'm hoping through my my experience at Disney to learn what it is to work on an animated project as a character designer to learn all the other yeah. little bits that go into it but what I'm also hoping to do is if we're going to talk about the 12 year plan or the 10 year plan where I see myself I see myself in the next five years, and I can give you five. I can't give you 10 yet, but I can give you five. I see myself in the next five years in a position to write my, my own series, illustrate my own series, and then to option it and have it picked up and made into a show, which I'll also be showrunning. Love that. That is where I see myself, right? And once that's been achieved, then we move on to the 10-year plan, which is to have my own publishing house, where I'm also publishing those books, and I'm also publishing other people's stories as well. So... There, there's, it's all possible and that's the glorious thing that's the comparison from where I was in 2016 where I was just couldn't see you know I had the plans and the dreams but I couldn't see it there's also something now. yeah there's something particularly compelling about the fact that you you target children right because these these are going to be the future if you can get in with these kids now in 10 to 15 to 20 years these are going to be the adults who are having children you know it, so, it goes it so, turns down generations one of the craziest aspects of what I'm doing right now, right, is my friends are all having kids, right? And all their kids are growing up on my content. And that's, I, I don't even understand. I didn't get it until like World Book Day um, this year. We had 200 plus kids dressed up as Rocket. And a few of those kids wow. were my friend's kids. And it blew my fucking mind. I remembered sitting there thinking, holy shit, like, we're, we're really doing this. Like, and wow. imagine friends' kids who I've met, right? Like friends, kids who I've met before I became the guy who drew draws look up. Right, that's like that that Notting Hill experience. I was going to say in your career on steroids times a right? hundred on on yeah. on 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 absolute crack, basically on crack. Like because this is a global thing now. This book has been to places in the world that I've never seen ever. Right, and yeah. like you know, one of the things that that hit me, kids, my friends, kids who you know they've met me before, like. All of a sudden, they meet me again, and look up is their favorite book, and I'm just like, they're looking at me so differently. They're like, they don't want to talk to me. I'm like, I'm dare I say they're looking up to you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, something, so, something of that nature. But like, it's just, it's just so trippy, and it's so, so trippy. And this is, this is the thing that dawned on me. It's like, I, you know, I, I try not to think about it too much, but. I do think to myself, like, there is a certain amount of responsibility that comes with that in the kind of stories I want to tell. And this is where I'm at now. I'm thinking about the kind of stories I want to tell. I'm thinking about, you know, what I want these children to remember, especially the black children, I'll be honest. I want them to have, I want them to have things that I didn't have as a kid, 
you know, I want them to have, you know, so a, a lot of them are fortunate in that, you know, their parents are of a certain generation, so they think differently. But at the same time, there are still a significant number of black children who are the product of children that are now adults that were raised by people like the people that raised me, who didn't instill them with all those virtues and all of those things. And as a result, they may not know to instill their children. So I'm making books essentially for that child. You know, it's great if a child who's had all of that stuff gets to see more of it in my book, but it's essentially for the kid that doesn't, hasn't had all of that stuff to see a place that's, where they can get it. Because I'll tell you one thing. Yeah. I'll tell you one thing. Books saved my life. So it's no co coincidence that I'm doing this. Yeah. Books reading was my escape. Like I, I didn't have a particularly great upbringing, um, but reading was my escape reading was my only escape so it's weird that i'm now working here doing this it's meant you know to be, offering yeah. children the opportunity to so yeah yeah <laughs> this yeah, guy that's, that's that's me 